Let's start thinking about repairing systems and not just putting a Band-Aid on it. You have diabetes, drug number one, then you escalate to drug number two, then you get cardiovascular disease, you have two more drugs there, right? So everybody is going along with the system and uh, nobody wants to change it. We know that nutrition can revolutionize almost everything in medicine. It's not gonna cure everybody, but it can certainly make an incredible difference, more than we've ever seen. Hey everybody, welcome to the podcast. Today we're gonna to talk about the science of fasting, the science of nutrition, longevity, and disease prevention with Dr. Walter Longo, one of the world's leading researchers in this field, returning for his second appearance on the show. Named one of the 50 most influential people in healthcare by Time Magazine in 2018, Dr. Longo is a professor of gerontology and biological sciences at the University of Southern California. He's also the director of the Longevity Institute at USC, as well as the director of the Longevity and Cancer Program at the IFOM Institute in Milan, Italy. In addition, Walter is the author of the international bestseller, The Longevity Diet, all profits of which he donates to research and to his foundation. And he's the creator of something called the Fasting Mimicking Diet. Today, we pick up where we left off four years ago, episode 367, if you missed it, covering the latest research on fasting and the five nutrition pillars of longevity. We discuss various fasting strategies, the acute versus chronic effects of food on metabolism. We talk about optimal protein intake based on age, high fat versus low fat diets, how to think about and contextualize other protocols emerging from health span science and technology, and many other topics. I love geeking out with Walter. He really is one of the world's brightest minds on the cutting edge of longevity science. And this one is full of prescriptive advice, including how to separate what we know from overblown hype. So if this channel is providing you value at all, all I ask in return is that you take a moment to click that subscribe button. Thank you very much. And with that, I give you Dr. Walter Longo. Walter, it's great to see you. It was awesome to reconnect with you in Miami recently. I'm glad that I did not give you COVID <laughs> experience. Um, it's been four years since we since we did this, and you know, after seeing you, I thought it would be great to have you back on. Um, and there's so many things I think that we could talk about. Uh, there's been a lot of research in science since four years ago, um, but I thought a good place, an interesting place to start, would be with this recent study that just came out. This study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, a study coming out of China that showed that intermittent fasting had no impact versus regular feeding windows in terms of weight loss. Now, I know your expertise is in longevity and not weight loss, but because this study was sort of widely covered in the media and caused a little bit of a kerfuffle amongst fasting enthusiasts in the kind of wellness world in general. Um, I assume you're familiar with this study and I thought it would be wise to kind of solicit your thoughts on it. Yes. So um, this, my understanding of the study was that they looked at long-term calorie restriction plus or minus time-restricted eating. Mm -hmm. So either you're calorie restricted severely and then you eat within a window of eight hours, I believe. Yeah. Or or you just calorie restrict it. So first of all, it's really a pointless study because uh, these long-term uh, calorie restriction studies, we already know that they're gonna result in people regaining the weight back. They're too excessive. And also most people don't realize that they're probably associated with this thrifty mode, meaning that the body eventually slows down metabolism. We know this from multiple color restriction studies. And so now you're stuck, and there was an old New England Journal of Medicine study mm -hmm. showing that. So now you lose weight, but now your, your metabolism adjusts even lower than your, adju your adjustment per kilogram of body weight. So that means that you're pretty much condemned to regaining all the weight. Right? So, mm. so it's a pointless study to begin with. Uh, and then uh, in addition to that, you add the, the time restricted eating, 
I don't think it's a valid argument. You know, I'm not a big fan of 16 hours a day. I'm a big fan of 12 hours of fasting a day. And, uh, uh, but I don't think it should be used against the 16 hours uh, because it was just, um, you know, a, a, a study that, that shouldn't have, I don't think it should be done uh, not that way, uh, mm-hmm. and it doesn't really lead to to any conclusions. You know? Right. I mean, what was interesting about it, I mean, first of all, it was conducted over a period of a year. So at least according to the media, that was the longest term under which they had studied humans with some kind of setup like this. But the feeding window was 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., which I guess, in, I mean, it's sort of like eating an early dinner. It's not that different than a normal feeding window. Yes, but but again, um, you're associating it with severe calorie restriction, right? right. So, it was like so this idea, 1500 calories, fifteen right, to which is you know, or something for like that. Males is severe calorie restriction, yeah. even worse than what Walford the, and my and other people did in the past, right? So these are these are um, already starting with something that is so extreme that, and, and at the end of the study, you can see that what, what we know happens in most cases, they start regaining weight, right? So. You know, starting the eight or nine months, you start seeing the, the weight regain, mm-hmm. uh, which which is, you know, again, what's been observed in so many studies. Right. I mean, they also identified no substantive difference in, in risk factors, which of course is related to longevity. But in your mind, is that a function of the calorie restriction or why, did, why was that part of the result as well? Well, I mean, if you go from 25, 3,000 calories, 2,500, 3,000 calories a day to 1,500 or whatever, um, yeah, it, it's not surprising that an addition, compacting it into uh, eight hours uh, versus however many hours, it makes no difference. Right. So I don't think that says anything uh, about fasting in general. I mean, fasting, first of all, is not 16 hours every day. I mean, fasting is a lot of different techniques. Some yeah. that work and some that don't. Um, and that one, um, you know, happened to, I think it told us that if you're already severely restricted, you know, eating within eight hours doesn't help you any, any further. You know? Right. So we're going to define these different fasting modalities, what works, what doesn't, um, in your opinion, and uh, how we're thinking about longevity. But before we do that, I mean, if you were to construct a proper study, what parameters would you set up? Like, what did they get wrong and how could somebody do this where it would show, you know, a legitimate, effective result that would be reliable? Well, yeah. Well, first of all, uh, you don't want to do uh, severe uh, interventions like that, right? Because people will abandon it. And then when they abandon it for a few times, it's worse than when you never started, right? Mm-hmm. So it's better to let somebody be overweight and even obese than take them through these yo-yo cycles of losing a lot of weight, regaining a lot of weight, right? So we, we know that from, from studies previous study. So yeah, you, you wanna, um, as we do in, in I have two clinic, foundation clinics, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and uh, we try to minimize the changes and try to be as effective as possible with minimal changes. And you wanna probably take a couple of years to get there. So we have diabetes patients and people with cardiovascular disease. It takes a couple of years to convert somebody, but really convert them into something that they can sustain for the rest of their lives, right? So you want to intervene, for example, the longevity diet, uh, you know, which I j- just published an article, uh, you know, describing why the longevity diet uh, um, should be adopted. It's a um, it's a high carbohydrate, but not high refined carbohydrate, mm-hmm. and not a low sugar, low refined carbohydrate, high carbohydrate, composed of lots of legumes, lots of uh, whole grains, nuts, et cetera, et cetera. So. That's the type of diet. Of course, each person is gonna have a different version of it, right? So this is not meant to be, so if you're gluten sensitive, mm-hmm. you're probably not gonna have a whole grain, high carbohydrate diet, but uh, um, but you can pick a, a different type of high carbohydrate diet. So, so by just the protein uh, restriction, we now know to be regulating weight, right? So, so the people, most people, lots of people eat a lot of proteins, to lose weight. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that it looks, based on our research and the research of many others, to be the opposite, right? The, the, the protein restriction is leading the system to go into a, a fat catabolism, a fat burning mode. So this is just one trick. Uh, the other, another trick is eat a lot, right? So if you eat legumes, it might take um, a pound of legumes to get 45 grams of proteins. Uh, if you eat you know, a steak, it takes 
200 grams, right? So mm-hmm. a lot less, right? So, so um, I think there's lots of tricks to get somebody to, in short term, lose weight, particular abdominal fat, without losing a lean body mass. We just finished a study where we're looking at Mediterranean diet, and 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 after four months of the Mediterranean diet, patients lost three pounds of muscle mass, and after seven months, uh, sorry. After, yeah, three pounds and after seven months, five pounds of, of lean body mass. Mm. So, so I think that there is a whole uh, system um, uh, to be uh, adapted. Um, and as you know, I believe in this periodic fasting mimicking sure. diets um, that can get you to slowly lose weight uh, without losing lean body mass. And, uh, and again, in a couple of years, by a combination of the everyday longevity diet, which I just described, and the fasting mimicking diet, mm-hmm. um, I think that um, most people that adhere to it are gonna uh, mostly lose uh, fat, but also you know, undergo some type of reset, uh, you know, going after insulin resistance, going after um, maybe some inflammatory issues, uh, certainly uh, some uh, cholesterol, high right. cholesterol, et cetera. So you mentioned this article that recently came out. I, I assume you're talking about the, the article in Cell that you co-authored with Rosalind Anderson? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so explain that. I thought that was really interesting. It basically it basically establishes the parameters for this longevity diet and why it's so effective. So maybe explain what the longevity diet is and what this article kind of explored in terms of the link between nutrients, fasting, genes, and longevity, uh, et cetera. Yes, so the longevity diet tr- uh, tries to move away from an you know, opinion and move into a multi-pillar system, How right? Dare so we're, you. we're yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so you know, uh, for sure, the epidemiological studies, lots of epidemiological studies, so studies of big populations, but then and then the clinical studies, the the centenarian studies, and lots of focus, at least in in that uh, paper that you just mentioned, on uh, model systems, right? So, what happens in mice, and what are the genes that control aging, and what are the n- nutrients that control the gene that control the aging process, right? So, uh, so that on one side you have the obesity and, and all the problems that come with it. On the other side, you have the acceleration of the aging process itself. And we know, uh, we, we always think about smoking and, and obesity as major risk factor for diseases, but when you compare them to aging, they disappear as mm-hmm. risk factors, right? So, so targeting aging is the most important thing, even more than obesity, way more than obesity, mm, right? Wow. So if you can slow down just a little bit, uh, the aging process, you can do much more than obesity uh, does. Of course, obesity and smoking are a big second and third, but uh, but they are, are dwarfed compared to uh, to the aging process. Right. So you, you began your career looking at yeast, aging in yeast to try to identify what these mechanisms are. Um, maybe explain how this is applicable to human health and, and what exactly like how we should think about what that aging mechanism or process is. Yes. So actually I started with Roy Walford working on, mm-hmm. on humans and mice, and I understood that it wasn't going anywhere. So I went back to yeast uh, uh, from humans and mice, right? So which at the time people thought it was a, just a bad idea. Right. And uh, so I think that uh, if you look at the genes that regulate aging in many organisms, and we think humans, so because now we have, we've been following uh, people with a certain mutation, which I'll talk about in a second, um, the growth pathways seem to be at the center of the aging process. So if you take a yeast, a fly, a mouse, and now uh, we'll talk about humans, um, they, they live a lot longer if you block IGF-1, insulin, uh, and other growth factors. And um, and so, uh, and not only they become a lot longer lived, so in yeast, for example, by blocking this protein pathway, and then on the other side, blocking the sugar pathway and then starving them, they live 10 times longer, right? Mm-hmm. So you completely reprogram their, their ability, their, their lifespan. Um, and this is compressed as you move up. So in mice, you, they live about 40 to 50% longer if they have deficiency in these growth genes, particularly the growth hormone gene and the growth hormone receptor gene. Um, and so when we then study humans, those deficient in the same gene, growth hormone receptor, uh, we haven't proven yet longevity extension, but they're protected from cancer, they're protected from cognitive decline, they're protected from diabetes. Uh, so they seem to be protected from most of the human um, chronic uh, 
age-related disorders, right? So, mm. uh, so we suspect that we're also gonna see uh, lifespan extension. We're not gonna see 50% like in mice, but even if we saw 10%, 15%, with very little uh, chronic diseases, that would be, uh, I think, remarkable. How do we understand the nature of that compression as we go from yeast all the way up to humans and why it doesn't scale in a more linear fashion? Probably because of evolutionary theories, meaning that um, every organism um, was, has evolved by being able to have different modality, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, yeast, you can have a modality, it's a life in the fast lane, and they live about two or three days, then you can starve them a little bit um, or starve them and they live uh, about two weeks. And then you can you have something called the spore state. And in the spore state, they live a hundred times longer than in the, in the fast lane, mm. right? So they live years. Um, so that tells you that probably in every organism there are, you know, there's like a, a reproductive uh, grow, grow, grow uh, mode. And then there is a maintenance mode where the decision is made that there's probably not enough food, not enough to grow, not enough to reproduce. So I'm just gonna stand by and try to protect myself as best as I can. So now, of course, most of us are not reproducing most of the time. So uh, probably a good idea, right? To switch to that modality and stay there until we are uh, ready to reproduce. Yeah. Right. Okay, so then with respect to humans, you've identified these five pillars of longevity. So maybe we can walk through them and then get drilled down more specifically on the, the, the diet piece. Yes. So, so in, in, the, in this study you just mentioned, uh, epidemiology, of course, is very central. So lots of studies, um, epidemiological studies, looking at you know, what people that live long eat, right? And, and so one thing we published on a few years ago was if you look at Americans, those that have a high protein diet, they do very poorly compared to those that have a very low protein diet, but that's only true up to age 65. Mm -hmm. And then after 65, it turns that it turns around a little bit and those that have a moderate protein intake do better than those that have a low protein intake. And, um, and so and I think if you look at the data and if you look at the Harvard studies, they're supportive of this, right? So they, they will say that a low carbohydrate diet is bad for you in general, um, unless it's a plant-based low carbohydrate diet. They haven't looked so much at the age, um, you know, dependent effect, but I think we are in agreement that low carbohydrate diet and high protein are not good for you. It should be the other way around, low mm -hmm. protein, high carbohydrate. And so epidemiological studies are, I think generally consistent uh, with this notion. So for example, there's another uh, Lancet meta-analysis looking at uh, carbohydrate intake, and it's better uh, for lifespan to be an 80% carbohydrate diet than to be in a low carbohydrate diet. And if you go to a very low carbohydrate diet, I say 20%, there's a 60% increased risk of mortality compared to the 50, 60% oh, wow. of uh, the calories coming from carbohydrate. Um, so, and, but then what happens is that people confuse this with excess carbohydrate. They, they think that when I say high carbohydrate diet, I mean excess, so excess carbohydrate. So we had doctors, for example, complaining, say, well, now we, we're in, in, in uh, United, United States, 70% of people are overweight and obese, and you're talking about high carbohydrate, high, high carbohydrate diet. But in fact, I'm talking about proportions, right? So you gotta get food some, from somewhere. Of course, you have to have the right amount of calories. You cannot have excess, but you know the, the but fifty to sixty percent should probably come from carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so epidemiology shows that. And then, if you just to give you an example, right? If you th think about carbohydrate, if you um, look even in, in a yeast or, or a mouse, if you feed them a lot of sugar, in most of the, the cases, um, you're going to accelerate some of the aging uh, pathways uh, on the sugar side, and then very even more clearly on the uh, protein side, but especially on the amino certain amino acids, like methionine seems to be at the very center of, uh, um, of the acceleration of the aging process. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and this is pillar uh, two, right? So uh, basic research. And uh, um, then uh, clinical studies, I think are pillar three, they're very supportive of, of all of this. Um, and so, for example, um, in, the, in the longevity diet, we talk about 
Um, certain fats, yes, but certain type of fats. And if you look at, for example, the, the work by uh, Astruc in Spain, thousands of people randomized one group uh, at risk for cardiovascular uh, disease, one group placed on a low uh, fat diet, and one group placed on, on uh, uh, lots of olive oil or lots of nuts. Right? That was like, that was a, there was a study that came out like just last week about that. I think. Yeah, there's been many studies yeah. that followed up. I didn't see the, 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 maybe there was one last week. I didn't see that one. But now it's pretty consistent in showing that, you know, the high olive oil, high high nut diet is um, uh, better. For, right, for people. which is so interesting and somewhat counterintuitive with respect to cardiovascular disease. Yes, historically, and, and to this day, lots of prominent uh, experts Mm -hmm. will say, go to a, a no-fat diet, no matter what it is, right? So sure, it seems to be true. Uh, it's better to not have saturated fats, animal fats. And again, the epidemiology agrees with that. But when we're talking about uh, these monounsaturated fats, olive oil, nuts, um, probably certain fish like salmon, that seems to be consistently associated we live in longer. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the, the centenarian study is, of course, one of the most important pillars. So if a low carbohydrate diet is not so good for you, let's look around. Let's look at Okinawans. Let's look at people in Sardinia, in Calabria, in Loma Linda, uh, in Costa Rica, in Greece. Uh, do they have a low carbohydrate diet? Or do they have, as we will expect, a high carbohydrate diet? And all of them, a high to right. very high carbohydrate diet, including the Okinawans, uh, we used to get about 70% of the calories from uh, uh, sweet potatoes, right. as you heard at the mm -hmm. conference uh, yeah. from, from Dan Budner. Right. So with all of that, <clears throat> and of course, it's about when you're talking about a high carbohydrate diet, you're talking about, you have to drill down on what that means specifically. It's not eating pretzels and right. tons of you know refined carbohydrates. These are like whole plant foods for the most part. Yes, I mean, it can also be whole grains, right? So whole grains in this study done by this Norwegian, this meta-analysis came out a couple of months ago, but this Norwegian group, uh, the number one uh, source of food associated with life expectancy increase was legumes. And number two was uh, uh, whole grain uh, uh, cereals, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so um, the, uh, the, it's not just, um, you know, let's say uh, vegetables, uh, but it's also uh, lots of, you know, carbohydrate that um, may not necessarily be associated with uh, um, health, right? For example, say whole grain pasta, but even pasta, uh, it's probably okay, right? If you don't, certainly it was okay for most of the centenarians uh -huh. in most areas. Um, and so, for example, for the Okinawans, the sweet potato, right? You wouldn't necessarily think the sweet potato is that good for you, but uh, it was very good for them. And um, so I think you you cannot for sure have lots of bread and, and lots of potatoes and lots of uh, pasta, but uh, a certain amount of it is probably um, not bad. And don't forget that our body doesn't, is not fueled by uh, complex carbohydrates, eventually is fueled by sugar. Right? Mm -hmm. So eventually it gets turned into pure sugar and that's what the brain and every other cell wants, uh, unless you have ketone bodies or fatty acids around, right? So, so yeah, sometimes we forget the basic biochemistry, but we are fueled by sugar. Mm -hmm. So with this understanding, the kind of basic tenets of what comprises a diet that, that promotes longevity based on this research, where does fasting come in? Come in? Like, what is the relationship between these dietary pillars and these protocols around fasting or fasting mimicking? So I think there are two, I, I always look first at the safety factor, right? So what is it that we don't know if it's safe or not? And then I just exclude them until we have many decades, mm -hmm. I think, of, of evidence. But if you, if you look at safety and efficacy both, uh, I think you come up with 12 hours every day as being very solid, I always say, I've never seen a study showing that if you do 12 hours of fasting a day, you're gonna have a problem. When you get to 16, and as we, I think already discussed before, you get to 16 hours, you get to skip breakfast skipping, and you see meta-analysis, not just studies, but studies of all studies showing uh, increased mortality, reduced lifespan. Now, what is the reason for it? 
We don't know. Probably there are double-edged swords, right? So for example, ketone bodies, maybe fatty acids, ketone bodies are going both ways, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're helping you on one side and they're hurting you on the other side. But so 12 hours, very solid, right? And, um, and the work by Sachin Panda and, and, and everything else is supportive of it. Um, and then I would say uh, probably people, uh, we eat all the time. And so um, in the in thousands of years ago, uh, but as humans evolved, we evolved probably insulin resistance as a way to survive the winters, right? So, so you uh, eat as much as you can during the summer or whenever food is available, you become diabetic, essentially pre-diabetic or diabetic, you put everything away and then the winter comes or some period where there is no food and then you become insulin sensitive again. Mm. So um, I think what happens now is everybody is insulin resistant mm -hmm. all the time. Or, or somewhat insulin resistant all the time because the winter never comes. And that's where this prolonged, not just you know 16 hours of fasting, but say five days, that's what we've been working on. That's where they come in. There, there seems to be pretty clear. Now we have three more clinical trials that we are about to publish. Very clear that they switch you into an insulin sensitive mode. So, and also in a, they switch you into a long-term anti-aging mode. So for example, leptin, and now it's, this is about four clinical trials of, uh, that we've done. Leptin stays low for a long time after you, you to return to normal diet. IGF-1, the central growth factor pro-aging, it stays down for months. So we, in the first trial, we showed that after three months from the end, IGF-1 was still lowered. Mm. Um, yeah, so th then I think that there is a, on one side insulin sensitization. So the system now goes into a fat, utilization mode versus uh, uh, building. And the system also goes into a maintenance mode. So now I'm just gonna protect myself as much as possible, age as slowly as possible, uh, waiting for the next uh, wave of lots of food where maybe I can focus on, on reproducing. Right. So with this understanding that there is no winter, the winter is not not coming and, and, and everybody's kind of hurtling towards some degree of, you know, being pre-diabetic because of the Western way of eating, how malleable is that? Like if somebody has been in that pre-diabetic state or in a situation where they lack insulin sensitivity for a prolonged period of time, what is your sense of how, how you know, how one can repair that? Like if, obviously if it, if you're, if you've just arrived in that situation, it's probably going to be easier for you through fasting and these other protocols to bounce back and create some insulin sensitivity. But if you've been in that state for a decade, does it become more difficult or can you still repair it? You can still repair it. We just finished like a trial mm -hmm. on diabetes in Holland, uh, 100 patients. And uh, I mean, I cannot tell you the result, but I can tell you that, that even if you're diabetic, you're obese, you got, you've been taking medicine for years and years and years, mm -hmm. no problem, we mm -hmm. can bring it back. Uh, I, I, we cannot bring it back in everybody, I would say the great majority of people, you have uh, the team, the physician, the dietitian, and you have to have the method. So, and, and in that trial, it was just fasting mimicking diet, no longevity diet. Yeah. In the clinic, we do both, right? And, but again, we don't push you to 1500 calories if you had 2500 calories. We push you to keep the calories, maybe just a little bit lower, you maybe go from 2500 to 2300, and then we work on the nutri tech, what I call nutri technology. We work on making it easier for you to lose weight rather than the starving you for a year, hoping that you, 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 you stay like that for the rest of your life, which you're never gonna do. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the four years since we sat down, there's been quite a, an explosion of interest in, in fasting. It's gone from this you know, kind of curious you know, endeavor into something that has truly gotten mainstream attention. A lot of discussion about different ways of fasting and many different, as you mentioned, different types of thinking about fasting, intermittent fasting, alter, alternate day fasting, time-restricted eating, fasting mimicking. Um, maybe it would be worth kind of just talking about fasting in general and the validity of these various protocols and why you feel so strongly that the fasting mimicking approach is optimal. Yes, so um, 
alternate day fasting, it's an extension of the 16 hours, let's say, right? So there is no doubt that if you do 16, 16 hours of fasting every day, or you don't eat every other day, mm -hmm. you're gonna get a lot of metabolic uh, effects. The, pr the problem and the question is, now that we have meta-analysis showing that if you skip breakfast, you live shorter, and you have more cardiovascular disease and probably more cancer, et cetera, et cetera, is there some issue with these ketone bodies, with these fatty acids, et cetera, et cetera. So no arguing with the metabolic effects short-term, but a big problem with long-term, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say, don't do it, right? Certainly don't skip breakfast. Uh, now what we're starting a, a trial in, uh, is now what happens potentially if you skip lunch. So you keep the 12 hours and then skip lunch. That's what I've been doing for 20 years. But uh, now we're gonna finally get to test it. We don't know, but, but let's see. And uh, um, so that's alternate day fasting or let's say 16, eight. Um, then you have, um, let's say five, two, right? That's mm -hmm. another popular one. Well, what happens if you do two days a week of, um, of fasting uh, or, or semi-fasting? Well, we don't know, right? Because there is not very many studies. There is a few. It looks promising. Uh, the problem I see with that is most people have a difficult time, I say, going from four coffees a day or three coffees a day to two coffees a day. Mm -hmm. um, half of the people that used to smoke are still smoking, even though we know that it kills you and it says that on the, on the package. Um, so it, is that gonna really be more than a small, small percentage of the population? So even if we show that was effective, Who's gonna do that, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know personally. Yeah. I don't know anybody that would go two days a week without, uh, you know, eating anything, mm -hmm. right? I don't know a single person. Uh, but that doesn't mean it could not be effective, and that doesn't mean there are there are not people that could do it long term. So I'm not arguing that you know with the effectiveness, and I'm not arguing that some people could do it. I will say the great majority of the people are not gonna do it, and then I will say we have, we even don't know what will happen long term. Right? Mm -hmm. So we gotta go with things that are more realistic, less invasive. And that's where the fasting making diet comes in. And this is, again, 30 years of work since the Walford years, right? So um, it's not an idea that you know, I say, oh, I see a few a patients trend. in my clinic, they're doing so well with these five days, I'm just gonna do that. As it happened for many very popular uh, diets in, in, in the past. So it, this was 30 years of building, building, building from all these pillars, right? And then you get to a point, it's like, where you say, this looks very promising. Like, what if we made people do this three times a year for five days, four times maybe? And if you have diabetes, in the diabetes trial, we did one cycle a month for 12 months. But most people did not do 12 cycles. Some people did two, some people did six, some people did eight, and some people did 12. So now we're going to analyze the data and we'll be able to tell, you know, who, who is doing well. But overall, they all did well. So, so I think that um, the three two to four times a year, let's say. Some people may even last, somebody like you probably, you know, a couple of times a year, mm -hmm. uh, it'd be more than sufficient. But for most people, let's say three to four times a year, that seems to be very realistic. It's clearly showing this long-term efficacy. Um, it, it doesn't, um, it, it allows for um, FDA-like, it doesn't have to be FDA, but FDA-like procedures where you can say, hey, this was tested, that's exactly the, the way you should test it and everybody can test it. Everybody can grab it. So now we have 30 clinical trials running. Some of them, you know, we help them with, some of them people just get it and they do their own trial. So that's the way it should be. Allow everybody to test it and let's see, right? Eventually we're gonna see these are millions of people and, uh, and we're gonna see the reports from it. And, and I, I really think that that's slowly moving in the toolkit of physicians on one side for lots of uh, uh, diseases um, but it's also moving in the toolkit of the people that are uh, paying attention and that, that they want something that is, is being clinically tested. Mm -hmm. And just because we haven't defined it, essentially what you're saying is this is a five-day protocol where we provide you through Pro Prolon this meal delivery, meal kit situation. And when you eat this way, 
you're mimicking your biological response to fasting without being overly calorically deprived. Yeah, I cannot talk about products, you know, because I'm prohibited yeah. from doing it. So in, in the FMD, um, you know, for example, for cancer, it's four days. It's very different from the, the one for normal people, which is five days, as you just mentioned. Then we have one for autoimmunities, it's seven days. We have one for Alzheimer, we're testing now in Italy, which is uh, five days, but then it has a daily supplement. Uh, for the in between, so it's it's really about nutri technology and uh, but yes, the fasting mimicking diet uh, uh, let's say it goes from four to seven days in most mm -hmm. cases, um, plus or minus what could be supplements. For example, in the Alzheimer, we were worried about people losing weight, and some people did lose weight, um, and so that's why we give them a supplement between the 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 twenty five days between one cycle and the next of the fasting mimicking diet. We also, because they're so old, let's say 75, 80, 85 years old, we give them a higher calorie uh, fasting making diet, right? So yeah, so we adjust based on on, on the age, on on the uh, on the disease, and uh, you know eventually, um, I think uh, there might be adjustments also. Right. Uh, for example, now we have uh, we're developing a non-inflammatory one. Lots of people with inflammatory bowel disease, uh, colitis, uh, gastrointestinal problems. We're developing something that is non-allergenic, non-inflammatory, which I think it's uh, it's going to be very important for. Uh, and we, I mean, the university. I don't mean mm -hmm. uh, I'm not talking about company. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's uh, that's certainly. Uh, I'll be very surprised if uh, uh, if this doesn't move into more of a mainstream and start competing with the drugs, right? I mean, that that's what we're trying to say. Like, let's start thinking about repairing systems you know, based on all the things that we discussed and not just putting a Band-Aid on it. You have diabetes, drug number one, then you escalate to drug number two, then you get cardiovascular disease, you have two more drugs there. And this is what happens. And it's really criminal, I think, you know, in the United States, in Europe, all over the world, as, um, um, you know, I call it unconspired conspiracy, right? So everybody mm -hmm. uh, is going along with the system and you have um, a lot of bad food, and a lot of lot of drugs that people take, and and the, the whole system is is uh, uh, profiting from it. But people, the average forty five year old now has got two chronic conditions in the United States, uh, and uh, um, and so by the by the time by the time you get to fifty five sixty, uh, you probably have about three chronic conditions, uh, taking lots of drugs, right? So you were saying, what is the system not to just block that, but to bring you back to a healthy mm -hmm. status? And you know it used to be ideas. Now we see it in the clinical trials, but we also see it in the in the foundation clinics where we follow lots of people. So so we're very confident that, that this can work, but it's not going to work unless the the you have you know the, the team that I was discussing earlier, yeah. the doctor, the dietitian, and the knowledge, and probably also the molecular biologist, right? So when you get to complex, so we get people at the clinic all the time, and they have very complicated problems, right? And so you have a very busy physician, even our own, right? And you have a very busy dietitian. And I think that the molecular biologist specialized in whatever field, it could be the key person, right? So the strategist, like, like I am, right? So this person comes in, works with the physician and works with the dietitian to, to strategize. How do I solve the problem? This person got three chronic conditions. Where do they come from? And how do I solve them without creating another problem, right? That's That's gotta be, uh, at the very center of everything, and it's not. Sorry to interrupt the flow. We'll be right back with more awesome, but I wanna snag a moment to talk to you about the importance of nutrition. The thing is, most people I know actually already know how to eat better and aspire to incorporate more whole plants, more fruits, vegetables, seeds, beans, and legumes into their daily routine. Sadly, however, without the kitchen tools and support, very few end up sticking with it. So, because adopting a plant-based diet transformed my life so profoundly, and because I want everybody to experience some version of what I've experienced, we decided to tackle and solve this very common problem. The solution we've devised, I'm proud to say, is the Plant Power Meal Planner, our affordable all-in-one digital platform that sets you up for nutrition excellence by providing access to thousands of highly customizable, super delicious, and easy to prepare plant-based recipes. Everything integrates with automatic grocery delivery and you get access to our amazing 
team of nutrition coaches seven days a week and many other features. To learn more and to sign up, visit meals.richroll.com. And right now for a limited time, we're offering $10 off an annual membership when you use the promo code RRHealth at checkout. This is life-changing stuff, people, for just $1.70 a week, literally the price of a cup of coffee. Again, that's meals.richroll.com, promo code RRHealth for $10 off an annual membership. All right, let's get back to the show. Well, what's interesting about all of this is understanding the incredible resilience of the human body. Like it can be abused for extended periods of time. And when you course correct that, it's kind of amazing that the body is able to get back to some sort of homeostasis without a pharmaceutical intervention. The trick of course, as you mentioned, is getting the medical establishment to truly grok this and make it part of what is recommended in their protocols. So what is your sense of, of where you're at with that right now? Like, do you have doctors who are on, I'm sure you do, that are prescribing this, that are on board with it? And what is the resistance or the obstacles that you still face? I mean, obviously the gold standard would be getting it to be medic, uh, you know, reimbursed by insurance and you know, that kind of thing. I, I, I assume you're not quite there yet. There are, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40,000 doctors around the world that are mm -hmm. now this, uh, recommending fasting mimicking diets. Mm. And I think they're all saying more clinical data, more FDA style clinical data. And, and absolutely, right? So then we and others and many, most of the studies we're not doing, right? Well, all universities are doing it on their own. We're just helping them. Right? So yeah, so I think that uh, everybody's waiting for more studies. They're coming, lots of them uh, are already finished and we're about to publish them. Uh, but I think, you know, for, for cancer, Alzheimer, you know, autoimmune disease, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we're gonna see more and more. But I think in addition to the FMD, um, I, I, I've been talking to lots of politicians, both in Italy and here, and I'm saying, you know, imagine you have 70 over 70% of people that are overweight or obese with all the chronic conditions that we discussed. And I said, imagine if you say, well, people are uneducated in a country, but I'm not gonna have schools and I'm not gonna have teachers, but I want everybody to be educated. It's never gonna happen, right? Mm -hmm. You can say it as much as you want, right? Until you build the schools, until you have the teachers, it's not gonna happen. So here we know that nutrition can revolutionize, you know, almost everything in medicine. It's not gonna cure everybody, but it could certainly make an incredible difference, more than we've ever seen, right? So certainly anything that is obesity related uh, and, and uh, uh, overweight related. So, but we need to have the schools uh, and we need to have the teachers, right? Mm -hmm. But these are gonna be schools and teachers of nutrition and, and lifestyle. And uh, I think that that's by far the number one, uh, the number one thing we're missing. Um, then I think, you know, if you can get that, as we've shown in a, in a mouse study that we recently did, which you, you may have seen before, you know, so we, we say, okay, forget it. It's never gonna work. So let, let the mice eat lots of fat and lots of calories and become huge. And then once a month, we give them the FMD, the fasting mimicking diet, and we reverse everything, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I'm sort of going against that. I, I, I think people you know, should be followed and should be professional. So you don't get into very bad diet every day and then use the FMD to fix it. But I think that's the idea of the FMD. Maybe for those that are not willing to make daily changes, um, that's where you, you bring in the, medicine, the food as medicine. And, right, right, right. I mean, it's such a massive problem because Every, every force that surrounds us is driving us towards that unhealthy choice. Everywhere we turn, all the marketing, the way the stores are configured, et cetera, you're almost bucking the trend in order to eat healthy and considered an outlier. So education certainly is central to all of that, but there's also a social piece and a psychological piece. And as Dan Buettner talks about, creating infrastructure or environments that are conducive to the healthy choice because like smoking that has the label on it that says it's gonna kill you. A lot of people just wanna eat what they wanna eat because it tastes good. And until they suffer from some kind of chronic ailment, they're really not gonna look in the mirror and redress it. Yes, and, and I think you get a, probably even get closer, right? So you, you have to have like the teacher in the school, right? You have to show up at eight o'clock and then you have to stay there <laughs> until such a, so yeah. yeah, no, I don't mean that for people, but I mean, um, you know, let's say for example, once a month, you have a telemedicine call on the computer 
with your dietitian, your molecular biologist, and maybe once every six months with the physician. Mm -hmm. that's, not, that's not very invasive, right? So, but now with, with all the apps and, and, and devices, you can monitor their weight from the distance. They wouldn't even have to tell you what, what they're weighing. You can monitor the blood pressure. You can monitor lots of different things. And now pretty soon, the glucose level, you're gonna be, be able to monitor without even you know, using a needle. Um, yeah, so I think we're already at a point where, and that's what we're doing in Italy, by the way, we're starting this 500 people clinical trial with control, fasting making diet, longevity diet, plus the fasting making mm -hmm. diet. So hopefully in about a year and a half, we'll have you know, uh, solid data showing, uh, I hope success. But yeah, so it's not school A to one, it's one telemedicine call once a month, uh, and uh, just to make sure that you're on track, you have any questions, you, and for example, with the cancer trial, we see that when we do that, it's very successful, very high mm -hmm. compliance. So we do a fasting making diet and chemotherapy, et cetera, et cetera. When we, the only trial, when we didn't do that, we allow the clinics uh, to do, uh, to just say, oh, here's a fasting making diet, you, you take it home and do it. And then we went to 30% compliance, right? So. Most of the people could not comply for more, maybe 50% for two cycles of the fasting making diet with chemotherapy, and then it dropped down, right? Mm -hmm. So it just told us that, yeah. And hopefully at some point, it'd be also good to have a psychologist involved, as you mentioned, right? So this team of four people, I think physician, psychologist, molecular biologist, dietitian, it, it should be our schools and our teachers uh, for lifestyle and, and, uh, and we don't have it. Yeah. Well, I think that some of these new apps and technologies can really help with compliance as well. Like I started working with Inside Tracker and Levels, the continuous glucose monitor. And there's something about being able to pull the app up and look at where you're at in real time that makes it very, you know, kind of maybe not urgent, but you're just connected to it in a way that's very different from going to your doctor once a year and getting your blood work done and seeing what it looks like on a piece of paper. Yeah. So how are you thinking about some of those technologies? Like, do you think there's a place for continuous glucose monitors with respect to kind of the, the, the avenues to which you're trying to push your, your patients or the, the people that you're working with? Yeah, the technology of course is gonna be central, uh, but I think the human part, uh, we, we cannot underestimate it, even if it happens by, by telemedicine, um, and the psychological part. So some lots of things will have to be done, uh, um, you know, all, the old style. But yes, as, as new technology comes in, and the ones that we're talking about, you know, whether it's the scale connected directly to the network mm -hmm. or um, it, the, the continuous glucose monitor, et cetera, et cetera, uh, those are gonna make the, everything easier. Um, but I think that now we're starting to, to start a program in South Central um, for, you know, you know, you're a very highly educated lawyer, right? So most people are, are, are not uh, as educated as you and I are. Uh, so I think that um, we need to also create the reality for, for people that may not have access to this world, this very mm -hmm. tech, high tech world. And so, yeah, so we're starting uh, a program in South Central and there, uh, you know, I think we're, we're gonna, if it gets funded, we're gonna try getting into the houses, right? And, and, and try to convert slowly. Again, take a couple of years, uh, maybe longer, right? And can we convert this family, the children, but also the, the parents into this changed lifestyle? And I think it's gonna take a lot of, I don't think we're just gonna be able to say, oh, here's, a, I send you an email with an with a application right. attached to it. Uh, I'll see you in a year. Uh, I think for the great majority of people in the world, uh, you know, for a, for a number of years, we're still going to need to uh, uh, to be uh, present, and the physician is definitely too busy and, and not trained for any of this. By the way, right? So, so then, yeah, we need to uh, we need to have this team, and uh, but the applications will certainly, and eventually, artificial intelligence and the collection of let's say microbiota data, metabolomic data, et cetera, et cetera. It's gonna take a while, but yeah. at some point, you know, you get a maybe a drop of blood and you'll be able to say, I, I don't know why, but uh, you have a problem with iron intake. Um, so, so you know, Leroy Hood and other people are working on, on this. And, uh, and so I think that, that yeah, but it's gonna be maybe five, 10 years down the yeah. road, right? So now I think uh, having a, 
you know, 70% overweight uh, group or obese group here and 50% overweight or obese in Europe, uh, you need to, we need to act now, right? So, and, and, and then once the technology comes, uh, I think that, um, that uh, even better. Yeah, well, you can't solve the problem without understanding how to solve the problem in underserved communities like South Central, because that's really where the problem rests. And those communities are, um, they're, not, they're not going on PubMed and reading research. You're, there's gonna have to be a completely different approach to try to figure out how to penetrate those communities and create real change. Yeah, and, and that's the extreme, but I think there is a middle group, right? Uh -huh. All over the United States that is not, in, in that conditions, maybe as a lot of people in South Central, but it's still gonna be much harder to penetrate than the Los Angeles uh, or San Francisco or New York highly educated individual that follows uh, you know everything sure. uh, we do, right? So I think uh, the majority of people live in a very different world and then, than some of us. And, um, and I think that, but the majority of people will appreciate if you get a call from a dietitian and a psychologist or this team once a month, I think the majority of people will respond very well. I and mean, we certainly see it with the sick people, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, whether they have cancer or, or diabetes, that sort of feeling like we're following them and we're, you know, okay, you got a problem, but here's the team. You, you, know, you, got, a, you mm -hmm. got a team following you and helping you, you know? So, so I think that psychologically, in addition to everything else is, is central. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'm curious about, and this, sort of came to me in the process of experimenting with a continuous glucose monitor is that you get this real time data after you eat and and you you can see you know the kind of curve and the graph of where your blood sugar is at postprandial um, but i'm wondering so it me as a consumer and not a scientist i can look at that and i can draw conclusions from that but i'm not sure those are the best conclusions because what's happening postprandial post meal is probably different from how it should be looked at from uh, like a chronic perspective, right? So when you're thinking about or conceiving of the what should go into the fasting mimicking diet or just a healthy diet in general on a daily basis, how do you think about what's happening um, biologically with each meal versus the chronic conditions that are the result of eating a certain way over a very long extended period of time. Yeah, so we uh, we get uh, all the time people, you know, they may do something that is contained in the fa fasting making diet and say my my glucose spike, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's not really about, I mean, your glucose should spike if there is glucose uh, or, or some uh, form of carbohydrate in, in the diet. And in the fasting making diet, we put the carbohydrates on purpose, right? It's a lot less than, than you will have um, in a normal diet, but it, it's still there. And, and, and it was designed on purpose uh, to make sure that uh, we don't have this yo-yo that I was talking about before. Why do I know that this yo-yo, let's say, um, you know, we went much lower in carbohydrates. Let's say we went to zero carbohydrate, 10%. I don't know that we'll, hurt people to go back and forth like that, but I'm worried that, that it may, right? So, and I'm also worried that it might affect muscle. So now we have three clinical trials showing no muscle loss and increase in, absolute, in relative lean body mass. And that's very mm -hmm. important. So now we believe that sugar, I mean, not sugar, but the, carbo, the little bit of carbohydrate we have in there. And, and even though they come with a little spike on, on, on fasting glucose, on glucose, <clears throat> we believe that be protective of the of the muscle mass, mm -hmm. and so um, now you know eventually we're going to look at at uh, um, you know more uh, lower glucose versions uh, to see what happens both for compliance and for for muscle mass, et cetera, et cetera. But um, but right now I think we we feel pretty good about having all these great results from clinical trials that. That's irrelevant, right? That, mm -hmm. And not just the fasting making diet. It doesn't really matter, every, even in the everyday diet. You don't don't worry so much about your glucose monitor and whether there is a spike. Worry about the consequences on abdominal circumference, body fat, insulin resistance, right? Mm -hmm. So if your if your A one C HbA one C is um, six point five, you got a problem. 
Uh, if you have a spike in glucose and it, your A1C is 4.7, you're fine. It means mm -hmm. that your glucose goes up, your body can process it. You know, I wouldn't do 20 meals like that a day. I would stick with, uh, say, two plus one or, or three meals a day, and that's it. So you only have three opportunities for that to happen. And that's perfectly fine. And it's obviously not affecting your body in a negative way. Uh, yeah, so it's very important right. to, um, you know, glycemic index, fine, but don't become obsessed with things that uh, are part of a much more complicated uh, network, including the, that may help you uh, protect lean body mass, right? right? So we now know that TOR um, can be affected. Well, we knew from our work in yeast, uh, you know, 30 years ago, but we knew that sh both sugars and amino acids can feed into TOR. And, um, and so now there's starting to be, you know, data uh, looking at, let's say, leucine levels um, being essential for mu muscle building, but the glucose might also be pushing that in the amino acids to perform uh, more, right? So, I mean, these are still preliminary data, but certainly now uh, that's a possibility yeah, that, yeah. that, you know, if you go too low in sugars, um, the muscle might struggle in, uh, uh, in building as long as you're insulin sensitive. Right. Um, let's go to protein for a minute. You mentioned earlier um, the idea that you've arrived at that, that lower protein before age 65 is, is optimal. And then after 65, it's important to increase your protein intake. So maybe walk me through how you arrived at that conclusion and, and what that means specifically for somebody who's listening or watching. Yeah, so if you look at the, uh, the mouse studies done, you know, for the past 50 years, a low protein is one of the ways that you can uh, uh, substitute calorie restriction to extend the life of, of a mouse. Then I think we did our study that I mentioned earlier, uh, clearly showing that the low protein group had overall lower mortality and, and the high protein group had a 400% increased risk for cancer mortality mm -hmm. compared to the low protein. Now, keep in mind that low protein doesn't mean you're not eating protein. It means that you have to have the 0.35 grams per pound of body weight. So if you weigh 100 pounds, you should have at least 35, 40 grams of proteins. If you go below that, now you're starting to get into malnourishment. So it's low protein without malnourishment. Right, which is, I, correct me if I'm wrong, about half of what the FDA would recommend. Isn't it 0.8? Grams per kilogram is per kilogram. Okay. I was talking per about kilogram. pounds. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. No. Yeah. So, point eight is fine, right? So we're we're staying with uh, with the most American uh, <clears throat> the medical association. So the American medical association, right. I think, says about zero point eight. So that RDA, but but in terms of like how most at least Westerners eat, that would be considered low protein, even though that's like kind of exactly what we're supposed to eat. Yeah. So the average American will have maybe right. fifty to one hundred percent more than mm -hmm. that, right? Yeah, and so so zero point eight is perfectly fine per kilogram, um, and then but then it should be mostly plant based. And I think our study, all the Harvard study, the Giovannucci, uh, Frank, who et cetera, et cetera, they agree with that. And um, the Centenarian, the Okinawans, at nine percent uh, calories from protein levels. The Southern Italians uh, certainly mostly plant based. Uh, um, uh, the Loma Linda people, low protein. So. It's, it's pretty clear. It's pretty consistent, pretty consistent, no matter where you look. And um, and so, and now the clinical data is also supportive of that potentially causing weight loss mm -hmm. and the opposite of what everybody thinks. So having a low protein, high, the right carbohydrate diet um, can, can lead to weight loss in, instead of weight gain. And uh, we'll have to wait and have bigger uh, studies, but that's, that's what it's looking like. It's, we're going to see uh, happening here. And is that related to a reduction in mTOR activation and IGF-1 le uh, levels? Or what is it specifically about the protein biomechanically that's happening? It, it looks like uh, certain amino acids are controlling, um, are controlling the fat cells and they're controlling the hypothalamus. And they're really in charge of the decision to um, accumulate fat or break down fat, right? So what we are I was talking about before about the fasting making diet, it looks like, and so we are actually now uh, submitting a large grant to, to study that in the brain. 
it looks like the certain amino acids are at least in charge or maybe half of those effects, right? So telling the body, okay, now I'm going to start burning fat or now I'm going to get into a, a fat accumulation mode. And, and um, yeah, so some of these um, switches are probably long lasting, right? Mm -hmm. So um, maybe epigenetic may not be epigenetic. So epigenetic meaning that the DNA is getting modified. And so once it's modified, this could last a long, long time. Uh, but uh, they're certainly long lasting. And this is why after the fasting making diet, which of course is very low in protein, we see the leptin down for a long period in people and we see the IGF-1 down for a long period. So um, yeah, so we don't quite know how to, the answer to your question, mm -hmm. but I think it's, um, it's looking like reprogramming. It's, it's got a reprogramming effect on multiple systems. And so what is happening around age 65 where that flips and it becomes more important to increase your protein intake? Yeah, so if you look at the Enhanced, which is the CDC database of, in the United States, and you look at the weight, right? So most people, and most people don't know this. See, most people, or on average, people gain weight until 65, and then they start losing weight after mm. 65. So there's something that we, uh, we don't know what it is, right? But aging, of course, is at the very center of that. And there may be some, some key moment of the aging process where you, you are now getting into this uh, uh, rapid aging modality. And, and, and we know that because you know, most of the, the, the deaths occur, occur after 65. So yeah, so after that, probably um, the, and this is also the Simpson group did in Australia did this in mice. So after, after a certain age, it may be that the redundancy, so that the system needs more of the amino acids to do its minimal job. And if you don't, if you start having a deficiency, you have a problem. And in our own study, we did it with mice. We took young mice and we gave them a very low protein diet. Nothing happened. We took all mice and we gave them a very, the same very low protein diet. And within days, they started lo losing a lot of weight. So it's probably a matter of redundancy mm -hmm. and maybe some of these growth factors are involved. And, and once you get below a certain threshold, um, you have a problem. And you may have a problem in the immune system, you may have problems with bones, with muscle, uh, you may have a problem uh, in, the, in the cognitive system. So yeah, so I think it's, uh, it's just unsustainable for, a, for an older organism. Well, it would seem that the more you're on top of these healthy practices as you inch towards 65 and after 65, the better position you're in to prevent those sort of declines being as rapid as they would otherwise. So if you're maintaining your muscle mass with resistance training, if you're eating appropriately in accordance with your protocols and the sort of blue zones criteria, and you're engaged in your community and you have purpose in your life, that you're that a lot of that like extension or prolonging of longevity is really about the robustness that you enter that stage of life with so that it doesn't hit you like a ton of bricks and you kind of become decrepit in an expedited way. It's an equilibrium of robustness, right? Because you, on one side, you could be feeding your muscle with IGF-1 and right. there's no doubt about it. And on one side, you could be feeding the cancer cell with IGF-1. And so as you enter that stage- But if you're doing the plant-based protein, well, if you're uh, doing the plant-based protein, then you increase your you're going to become frail intake. as most of the Southern Europeans, right? the Italians. Actually, the Don't Italians- tell me that, Falter. The Itali well, <laughs> not, um, yeah. So uh, we cannot mix the doing it right with doing it, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the Southern Italians are actually twice as frail as the Northern Europeans, right? Uh, or the Italians are twice as frail. At um, a certain so stage long in life lived. or later in life, they become more frail. Yeah, they're long-lived, but frail. That doesn't mean that you cannot be vegan or pescatarian and be very strong. Just there is like, and that's what we've been working both in Italy and here very hard with mice. We said, what is the nutrition, the age-specific nutrition that prevents the frailty to the bones, to the muscle, the immune system, but at the same time does not affect the longevity extension, right? Mm -hmm. It's very tricky. There's a sweet spot in between those yeah. two polarities. And there is an age-dependent sweet spot. That's why we're saying now don't go from low protein to high protein. Go from low protein to moderate, maintain the, the plant-based, uh, but start introducing more, let's say, vegetarian if, you're, if you don't want to have 
you know, meat component, a vegetarian component, more eggs, more cheeses, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, you can do it without any of this. You can do it with the seeds, the nuts, right? So it doesn't, you can be 100% vegan and do it. It's just a, a little bit more of a job to, uh, to do it with, uh, while staying vegan, but that's perfectly fine. Like, so, right, but when you're 100, what else do you have to do? Yeah, yeah, you could you could divert some of that energy towards being focused on that. It's, it's not just energy. You yeah. gotta have the people that sure. some people that know yeah, what they're yeah. doing, right? So, um, for example, the legumes are very low in leucine, methionine, uh -huh. et cetera, et cetera. But the seeds are not, and the nuts are not, right? So, yeah, you need to uh, pay attention and have somebody help you uh, guide right. you through it, because otherwise you can become osteoporotic uh, and not realizing it um, at all until you have a fracture and. and and then you're in trouble. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a guy in here who is 100 and he broke all these marathon records when he was 90 and 91 and just an amazing guy, but he went plant-based at 70 in response to a colon cancer diagnosis um, and has been plant-based for 30 years. And at age 100, he's as passionate about it as ever. And he still is running and training and doing all of these things. And so when you're saying that, like I understand everything you're saying and I see this living example of a guy who, who appears to be doing it correctly and was telling me he's having the most fun he's ever had in his life. So yeah. it's crazy. It, it may keep in mind a lot of people that are vegan eat a lot of proteins, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of vegan proteins. I'm sure right? he's eating a lot more protein. Than, yeah, right. yeah. So yeah, if you eat a lot of protein, let's say 25% of your, of your, and this is very common among vegans. Um, and, uh, and so for example, I think, uh, Luigi Fontana did a study where he was looking at, uh, um, the vegans and it, they were, their IGF-1 was actually pretty high, right? Mm. Because they were high protein. They had such mm. a high protein so diet. So even if you're eating a ton of plant-based protein, you can still drive up IGF-1. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It, it, because we're talking about 10% and below in our study, right? 10% of the calories or less had to come from proteins to be in the low protein group. So if you're now 25% of your calories coming from protein, you're most likely um, are gonna be uh, in the high risk. And in fact, in our study, we did the people that had mostly plant-based, instead of a four-fold increase in cancer risk, they had a three-fold in in mm -hmm. increase in cancer, in cancer mortality risk. So it changed yeah, yeah. better, <clears throat> but went from 400% to 300% increase risk of, of uh, cancer mortality. Mm -hmm. Prophets Walk Among Us. As a writer and podcaster for nearly 10 years, I've become more convinced than ever that our world is populated by scores of beautiful and brilliant people who have amazing stories to share. Those that we don't know who can teach us something new and leave us all the better for the experience of their sharing. And so I've dedicated my career to tracking down the most compelling prophets on the planet, going deep with each of them on my podcast to elucidate the best of what they have to offer and to sharing the insights gleaned for the benefit of all. But the podcast is not the only medium by which to share their stories, which is why I'm proud to announce the release of my new book, Voicing Change, Volume 2. More than mere words on paper, Voicing Change is a physical manifestation of the magic, inspiration, and timeless wisdom that transpires each week on the Ritual Podcast. The first edition of Voicing Change was a beautifully rendered book worthy of display on any coffee table. And volume two follows in that tradition by showcasing even more of my favorite conversations in an elegant publication replete with interview excerpts, essays, and stunning photography, making for an exquisite companion to the first volume or a satisfying standalone work. Picking up this book allows you to revisit the wisdom of your favorite everyday prophets and physically interact with the life-changing ideas contained within. Voicing Change Volume 2, available now while supplies last for a limited time. Order your copy today only at richroll.com. I'm interested in your thoughts on, on another, like the other side of the coin with respect to health span science and longevity, because a lot of the press is oriented around this, the sexiness of things like rapamycin and metformin and sirtuins and the like, which is very different than the kind of longevity science that you're interested in and focused on. So how are you thinking about 
what's going on in, in that kind of related field with respect to looking towards extending health span? Yes. So, so first of all, I come from that world, right? So I yeah. come from the world. We were testing rapamycin in yeast, and I think uh, we got it from Mike Hall back in 1995 or, or, or that. So we were probably the first uh -huh. lab in the world that was working mm. on rapamycin and longevity. And we're, you know, my lab discovered the role of the TOR pathway in aging in, in 2001. Uh, so we're very much, um, you know, supportive of the understanding of what genes and what drugs that affect genes uh, do. But I think that for the next 10, 20 years, maybe 30 years, the reality is that we have 3 billion years of what I call 3 billion years of R&D, right? So our body has been um, developing for 3 billion years, if you think about the, the origin of, of species. And, um, and so um, you could say, I can, I'm gonna biohack my way through it, right? So I have this incredibly sophisticated system and I'm gonna intervene with a drug that blocks TOR. But TOR does so many things, right? And guess what? If you block TOR in people with rapamycin, they become hyperglycemic, right? And mice become hyperglycemic. So it's just very clear evidence that it's not as straightforward as All these think. downstream, you, you have to look at it holistically and understand there's a, a bazillion intervening variables and it's all very complicated. It's very complicated yeah. and you have no data, right? So who knows what happens after 40 years of, of uh, um, of rapamycin or, or metformin. Mm -hmm. I mean, metformin has got more data, right? So um, in support of what Nir Barzilla is trying to do, metformin has got a lot more data, but even metformin, um, what, it, what happens if you give it to somebody that's perfectly healthy? Um, well, we don't know. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that uh, that's gonna be an issue. And also, but if you look at statistics uh, or if you do some calculations, um, the, the easiest, um, success is gonna come from something that is already existing for that purpose. So if you are a yeast, and I already know that I can switch you into a modality where you live five times or 10 times longer, because you've evolved that modality to sustain moments where you don't have enough to reproduce, then that's by far the safest, right? Because yeah. it's, it's, it's there for a purpose. So then the question is, um, is there a human alternative Mod modality uh, that is much longer lived. And everything points to yes, right? So otherwise we wouldn't see these uh, little people in Ecuador not getting uh, any disease. We have one guy that we just interviewed and he's 80 years old and he's been drinking and smoking every day of his life. Uh -huh. And everybody else does not have a disease. But we thought this guy is no way. And sure enough, never had any chronic <laughs> condition. <laughs> Uh, and is, is drunk all the time, smoking uh -huh. all the time. So, <laughs> so, um, so having him. the mouse data and having the um, the human data now and all the other organisms, we can we know that there is an alternative mode. So, if you're going to intervene with drugs, my opinion is that intervene in the master regulator. Don't intervene downstream, right? Mm -hmm. So, intervene very high up. Let's say the level of growth hormone, releasing hormone, growth hormone, etc because that's more likely to not interfere with anything intracellularly and, and not come up with uh, as many problems as solutions. Right. So I assume that would be the same perspective with respect to supplementation when we're, you know, you hear about NR and NAD and all the, you know, all of these kind of protocols that people are adopting in the, in the you know, kind of biohacking world. Do you see any efficacy or validity in, playing around with that or what do you think? Playing around with the research, yes, right? But but I think that um, when you have, you know, this is why we go multi-pillar, right? So mm -hmm. so you have, yeah, if you, you have to have the epidemiological studies, the clinical studies, the centenarians, you know, how many centenarians have been taking this for seven or 80 years, um, you know, and uh, what is the research on all these different organisms saying? So I think the closest you get to four or five pillars supporting it, and the more um, you can think about it, but it, it's hard to imagine, right? Uh, um, uh, any of this having that kind of support mm -hmm. thus far. So, so yes, you could say, I see. Take the 16 hours of fasting, right? Um, there again, there's no doubt that it's very beneficial. But then you gotta wait 30 or 40 years, and then you get the meta-analysis, uh, and people that skip breakfast have a problem. Um, so uh, you would never have known that for it, you know until you get to that point that mm -hmm. the famous uh, those famous uh, studies of all studies 
So, um, so then the question is for all these supplements and interventions, uh, where is the data uh, competing, let's say, with what we already know can get you to 100 to 110 now. Uh, so I think now we're starting, if you look at the, the, the study in Norway, uh, the life expectancy increase, if you started just what it's about a third of what I described in the longevity diet, uh, it was associated, if you started at 20 with 11 to 13 years of life expectancy increase. If you started at 60, it was associated with eight to nine years of life expectancy increase, right? So now you had the fasting making diet at 12 hours a day, the you know, three times as much. Now you're thinking 15, 20 years, not mm. thinking. The data will suggest uh, maybe 15 to 20 years of life expectancy increase. Um, so you introduce a, a supplement. What if that decreased your lifespan by 20 years after you take it for 30 years? Uh, so right. th that's what you we just, uh, we don't you, know yet. Yeah, you you have to make sure that you don't. Uh, we, we're not in Las Vegas, uh, and and this is people's lives, right? So you want to uh, take a chance like that. On, uh, on your life, much better to go with what we know than what we think right. uh, it's gonna happen. My sense from looking at, at, at your work is that <clears throat> what's good for longevity also appears to be good for cancer, cancer risk reduction. Is there a point at which those two diverge? Because you're looking, you're, 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 you are focused in these two worlds. So what's similar about them seems to be a lot. But is there anything dissimilar or, or something that somebody who is suffering from cancer or concerned about that should be doing a little bit differently from somebody who's purely focused on longevity? The only, the only thing that the the only concern is of course the the frailty and the cachexia, et cetera, when you are a cancer patient, right? So, and this is a big fight we have in every mm -hmm. clinical trial um, in many places around the world. So the 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 physicians will say. I'm not gonna allow you to put uh, this extreme vegan or close to vegan diet in between fasting mimicking diet cycles. And we fight you know, to get it in there because we're saying treat cancer first and get the cancer. And then we'll, if the patient is losing some muscle mass, uh, that's okay compared mm -hmm. to let's say a very rapidly advancing cancer. So yeah, but, but, but it's a legitimate concern. And so we, we've been, uh, uh, collaborating with Alessandro Laviano at the University of Rome, who's an expert in this and trying to uh, you know, get to the point. And, and in fact, in the clinical trial that we published last year, we were successful in doing that. So the women that had uh, breast cancer and received hormone therapy with the fasting making diet, we dosed the, um, uh, the in-between diet in a way that um, allowed them to maintain the, uh, a very good uh, lean body mass, mm -hmm. so muscle mass. Yeah, I noticed on your website, you have different uh, kind of protocols or marching orders for different types of people with respect to FMD. So you have protocols for people who are undergoing chemotherapy or about to undergo chemotherapy for pregnant women, for adolescents, et cetera. So how do those, how do those protocols like shift and morph depending upon your stage of life or whatever it is that you're kind of going through? Yeah, I'm not sure which website you're referring to. I so, can't remember. Uh, yeah, yeah, or yeah, yeah, maybe it was the other one. Yeah, if, if I mean, obviously for diseases, we 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 tell people talk to your physician, right? And, uh -huh. and, the, and together with your physician decide whether um, you know this should be uh, applied. And then um, you know, in most cases, we like to have a clinical trial rather than improvisation. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it's a discussion with your physician. And then um, you know, for everybody else. Uh, uh, again, you know, different people, different situations. Some people are going to need a dietitian to work with. Some people are going to need a physician to work with. Some people don't need anybody if it's just uh, trying to lose uh, uh, some weight and, and maybe again a little bit of reset. But uh, I think that, as I was saying earlier, the team is not there. Maybe it's, it's, it's not all necessary, but certainly a dietitian that knows what they're doing. Um, should be consulted before uh, starting. Uh, so we do this at the, at the foundation. Yeah. It's a nonprofit clinic in Santa Monica, and we have one in Italy. And so we'd be happy to help anybody that, um, in, even those that cannot pay at all. So we have a program for, for those right. that cannot afford even the visit. Right? So, so uh, I think it's, uh, it's good to uh, figure out what you need, right? So, right. yeah. Is there, 
what is the ideal period of life to begin this process? Like if you're a teenager, can you see benefits doing an FMD? Like what, what, what is your sense of what the science says in terms of younger people? Yeah, well, so we started a clinical trial in at Gaslini Children's Hospital for type one diabetics at age 10 to 18. And, um, and we've been talking to CHLA, Children's Hospital Los Angeles, about one for obesity and overweight control. Mm -hmm. So we don't know, and this should only be tested as a clinical trial. In fact, in Gaslini uh, Hospital, they're gonna be inpatient, right? So we, nobody wanted to take a chance with the children and, and allow them to do it outside. But um, um, yeah, I think that um, it may turn out, and, and, and I don't know, but we'll test it. We'll test it for the possibility that um, these five days of a vegan diet will allow the um, a physical improvement in the child, but also a psychological improvement, right? So it's an exposure to five days of a vegan diet with certain characteristics, which may be very different from what they eat all the time at school mm -hmm. and, and at home. And, um, and so that's our hope, you know, is it, is it able to reprogram the child uh, psychologically and physically so that they eat better. We clearly see this in adults, right? So that yeah, some of the effect, the IGF-1, et cetera, is not psychological, but some of the effect uh, we think is psychological, meaning that they, um, the, many of the adults are changing their relationship with food and they don't feel, um, they're not appreciating some of the bad food as much as they did before. Mm -hmm. Because now I think that, you know, in science, we, we have something called food aversion. So some foods are associated with problems and you stay away from it because they cause some other problems. But there may be also, probably there is also the opposite of food aversion. You feel so good with this vegan five days, you know, fasting mimicking diet that your brain might be telling you, uh, let's move in that direction because I don't know why, but I felt better in those five days, mm -hmm. right? And maybe in the few days following. So uh, yeah, so I think that the child, uh, the, my speculation is that the best moment in, to do it would probably be, let's say, in a teenager, mm -hmm. uh, because that could really change your life, right? So right. we know that, I wrote a book about children uh, and longevity, and we know that if, you st if you're overweight continuously from age seven to age 18, you have a fourfold increase in the risk of developing diabetes. So intervening in that, in that, uh, at that age could have, even a bigger impact than right than as you're as adult. you're forming those dietary habits that will become more calcified with age habits, but also potentially epigenetic changes, mm, right? Right. So we know that, for example, you can do a methionine restriction or a protein restriction in a mouse early in life and stop, and they live longer. It's really remarkable, right? So is there a connection to the microbiome with that? I would assume there there is some gut microbiome changes that take place that take root. It there, could be yeah. it could be affected by the microbiome, but it could be the the entire you know the brain and maybe cells in the brain, and the the the, the adipocytes, the fat cells. Everything is now reprogrammed into okay. Let's accumulate fat for potentially the rest of our lives, because and this is why some people, we we see people that have been say overweight for 20, 30 years, and you were asking earlier, right? it takes a long effort to convert them. So their brain is completely set into, I have to get back to that weight because probably it makes sense, right? So if you've been okay for 20 or 30 years at a certain weight, even though that is overweight, your, your, your brain is, is uh, trying to bring you back because it knows that you're stable at that weight. Mm -hmm. And so trying to move it to another weight, it's a, it's a challenge. And so yeah, so the child potentially could be condemned for the rest of its life, of his or her, her life, to be at this overweight st status, which you know evolution set to protect them and not to hurt them. You know? Right, and, and, and there's something metabolically that happens that creates like a, a set point that becomes very difficult to permanently alter. Like you can go on a diet, you can gain weight, you can lose weight, but ultimately you're gonna always settle back to that, that one place. Yes, and that's what I was saying. That's probably like this steady state that your brain recognizes uh -huh. as safe. Right. Because everything was working when you were there, right? Your reproductive system and everything else was working. So I know if I get you back there, let's say that you were 140 pounds, 
uh, a woman that is overweight, uh, 140 pounds. And the system, if you've been there for 25 years, the system uh, knows that you're doing okay at in, in 140 pounds. Uh -huh. And so it wants you get back there also because of what we were saying earlier, of course, it wants the reserves to be there. The fat accumulation is uh, part of survival, right? So you used to die <clears throat> if in those two months of no food, you did not have that extra, you know, 10 pounds or 20 pounds of fat. Uh, so, so there is more than you were healthy at 140. There is also, I don't want to take any chances. Let's keep that fat. Uh, so, so we yeah. stigmatize, right? obesity and yet obesity and even diabetes potentially is part of our survival mechanisms right so that's why it's so important to instead of no and now we're talking about oh you can now say every weight is good for you i, I think we need to move into uh, first of all don't stigmatize it because it's part of who we are and part of the what the emperor penguins and so many animals have uh, an obesity state periodically right so it's perfectly fine to be obese but um, it's not perfectly healthy to be obese all the time. And in fact, it's better to be at a normal mm -hmm. weight all the time. So, mm -hmm. you know, instead of stigmatizing, let's remove <clears throat> that, but let's also try to help people make it to a, a, um, a, a weight where they can be happier and healthier. You know? Is there a sense of the mechanism that's creating that set point? Because if you could really understand that, perhaps you could figure out a way of changing it. So metabolically, you create a new sort of, you know, steady state for that individual that would be healthier than whatever it is that they're currently settled on. Yeah, yeah, I think we're getting pretty close with yeah. the molecular mechanism, right? So, so, uh, so for example, in mice, when we, we take the mice on a high fat, high calorie diet, and then we give them the, the FMD, the fasting making diet, and you see, and then we look later, four days later and 15 days later, they're still breaking down fat, right? Mm. So and leptin is down, and, and so the whole system is now being rewired. Now, I think it's just a matter of, of details, but we have a pretty good handle of on, on what controls the, this different state, either put fat away or break it down. And it makes sense, right? You enter the winter state, and at some point, you fast for long enough, and mm -hmm. that's your switch, right? And so it's your switch, start, start breaking it down and continue to break it down. But then, as I was saying earlier, you fast for too long and now it's your thrifty mode. So now your system says, okay, now I'm gonna starve if I keep using fat yeah. at this level. So I'm gonna slow down my metabolism and I'm gonna try Hold to on, burn right. the fat more slowly. And that's why you need to have the science to get you, yeah, do the fasting making diet, but don't go too long. Don't go too short because you don't enter this catabolic mode. Don't go too long because now you're gonna enter the thrifty mode. Mm -hmm. And so- You have to thread the needle. You have to uh, convert the switch and then um, and then allow it to be in the uh, high metabolic fat burning mode. Um, and you know, for example, that sh that carbohydrate that we include in the fasting making diet, they could also be helping that, right? Uh, the, we don't know all the details of the molecular switches, but it could be that one of them is very low carbohydrate, you know, two, right. zero carbohydrate. This could be one of the triggers of thrifty mode. Okay, so now I am uh, um, I am uh, uh, going into uh, a, a very low metabolic mode because uh, I don't want to risk uh, running out of fuel. Mm. What is the role of exercise in all of this? Uh, you know, it, it would seem that if you're vigorously exercising, obviously you're going to eat more food. I don't know what the relationship between exercise is and metabolic health, but when you're burning more calories, maybe that changes the way that your body is dealing with all of this. Like, how does that all play into longevity? Yeah, so it shouldn't be about calorie levels. It should be about, uh, um, you know, the results of that, right? So if you're losing muscle mass, and um, um, then you probably need to eat more. Uh, so it's a, there is not a set level of calorie that should uh, you take on, and 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 you probably um, should eat more proteins. Um, so different people, different sports, different uh, uh, training regimen, uh, different uh, nutrition, and uh, of course you need to try to stay as close as possible to the longevity diet. But uh, but for some people, uh, you know, they might be too extreme. To maintain whatever the muscle mass or or um, mm -hmm. the ability to train 
um, that they have. And so they have to, you know, s- tweak it so that, that you can do what, what you think is so important to you. And, and um, so get the longevity benefits and don't yeah. compromise what's essential for your, you know, sport. Uh, yeah. Or, or, well, I guess I'm thinking more in the context of how, how exercise fits into longevity more broadly, because when you look at the Blue Zones communities, these people are not going to the gym and doing anything that's all that extreme. They're just living kind of consistently engaged, active lifestyles. Um, when you look at the way we think about exercise in the in the Western world, it is, you know, going to the gym, putting muscle mass on, or it's being an endurance athlete and going out and doing very long stuff. It seems that there would be sort of a middle ground where this is helpful in terms of life extension. But past a certain point, you're harming yourself or you're under undermining your body's ability to persist. Yes. So, so as I was saying earlier, lots of people in, in the blue zones are frail. Mm-hmm. Um, it's okay. I mean, it, 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 it doesn't kill you because they live long, right? So, but they're frail. So, um, and, and some of the people that might have record longevity probably have genetic predisposition to it. It's pretty clear. You know, I took a lot of trips in Italy and interviewing hundreds of centenarians. And, and I hear a lot, my sister made it to 95 and my brother made it to 92. And when you see mm-hmm. that, there's a, a big genetic component. But the Except lifestyle- with Loma Linda, maybe. That seems to be a unique case study. But Loma Linda does not have many centenarians, right? Loma Linda has longevity extension, you know, worker Gary Fraser and others, but not necessarily lots of centenarians. Mm. Um, so, so yeah, so I think that when you look at the, the meta-analysis for exercise, 150 minutes of exercise per week seem to be ideal. As you go to 300 minutes, you don't get any benefits. So now you want to probably keep to a, around 150 and learning from the blue zone and the centenarians, you know, it's, I would say uh, an hour of walking a day, maybe a couple hours of walking during the weekend. That seems to be a good compromise and also weight training. Yes, mm-hmm. they didn't do it, but you know, again, I, 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 I see them all the time. They're pretty frail. Uh, so um, of course they were not frail as when they were working in the field and, uh, you know, and doing manual labor, but when they stop, then they become very frail. So I think that's why it's so important to keep the weight training, you know, very light. For example, in a cancer patient, we have a video now we, we, we uh, utilize and there was 20 minutes a day of a very light muscle exercise, right? So just enough protein, light muscle exercise training, and then 150 minutes a week, which is not uh, that much. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then one hour a day of walking uh, and maybe a couple hours during the weekend. That seems to be pretty solid, no matter how you look at it, uh, whether the, the centenarians and the blue zone people were right or whether the meta-analysis are correct uh, but I think that's why you want to get the common denominator. Yeah, let's just get in the middle of all of it. And and does this uh, violate anybody's rule? No, it doesn't. Uh, so I don't think a centenarian will say 150 minutes of, uh, you know, a little bit more strenuous exercise is going to hurt you. And and again, lots of them, that, like the shepherds, you know, they used mm-hmm. to um, do, you know, 5, 10, 15 miles a day going up and down the hills, right? They might not be... Um, uh, exercise the way we, we view it, but uh, pretty close, right? Yeah. Pretty close. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and even the women that stayed home in, in Seul or Villa Grande Strisaili, when we interviewed them, they say, yeah, my husband used to go, uh, you know, uh, and walk with the sheep, but, but I would be in the field uh, as, as I was a farmer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a, lot of, mm-hmm. that's a lot of energy that goes into farming. So yeah, I would say they uh, they probably did uh, a good portion of of exercise like uh, yeah. um, you know uh, activities. So walk me through your daily routine with food and exercise. What do you do in practice? Yeah, yeah so I do um, I, in, in breakfast. I have this uh, almond, almost one hundred percent almond uh, and cocoa uh, spread, very low sugar. And then I have, a, it's called a frisella. I get them both from Southern Italy. It's a whole grain uh, um, uh, toast, but mm-hmm. it's very particular, right? And um, and then I, um, in the United States, in the six months that I'm in the US, my lunch is a, oh, sorry. And then I have an apple and tea. 
Mm-hmm. That's that's what that's my breakfast. Every no morning. coffee. No coffee. Coffee is my lunch, right? So okay. that's all I have for for lunch is coffee. In the United States, in Italy, I can't uh, I can't skip lunch. <laughs> so I uh, I have I have lunch also in Italy. And then um, if 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 my weight is under control, then at five I will have another frisella and uh, and maybe another fruit. Um, if my weight t- tends up, then I, I skip the the snack at five p.m. And then it, my typical dinner would be uh, let's say about seventy grams of pasta, uh, about three hundred fifty grams of legumes, beans, chickpeas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm-hmm. And then um, about 300 grams of uh, mixed vegetables, like you know, green beans, et cetera. So it's a pretty big mm-hmm. dish, lots of olive oil, mm-hmm. and, um, uh, and usually like a little piece of bread. Um, that's, uh, so of course, then I have fish maybe two times a week, um, and that's about it. So that would break down, it feels like somewhere around 70% carbohydrate, Twenty percent. No, maybe fat, 10% maybe percent protein. Yeah, maybe 60 percent carbohydrate because I, I, I lots of uh, nuts, olive oil. Yeah, um, yeah. So those are of course more calories per gram. Um, yeah, so I would say probably uh, about 60, 30, uh, 10 to thirteen, fourteen uh, percent uh-huh. proteins. Yeah, and when you're in Italy, more pasta. No, more, not, more not big long more lunches, but lunch, lunch uh, more is added, and of course, and then I, I, I gain weight a little uh-huh. bit, not very much, but I gain weight uh, by doing this three plus one, three meals plus a snack, and um, so yeah. So now we're gonna test that uh, my my lifestyle on, on five hundred people. Let's it randomize. Let's mm-hmm. see what happens. But um, and all your blood markers are good and fine. I'm sure you're no drugs. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and of course, uh, I'm, I come from a family of hypertension and all kinds of problems. So yeah, thus far, I've, I've never taken a drug. Um, everything is in in, in place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And how old are you now? Fifty four. Fifty four. Not a gray hair on your head. No, I have. I have a little bit, but. Um, um, and how often do you do the FMD then for yourself? I do the FMD maybe a couple of times a year, but I'm uh-huh. pretty strict with the rest, right? So, so I think that in the trials we see that. I mean, the, the ones that are like the examples of health, they're not benefiting at least acutely as much as the normal people, let's say, right? Um, yeah. So I think that that I'm already um probably because of the longevity diet every day and the 12 hours i do that for, so i do 12 to 13 hours of fasting mm-hmm. per day um and um so yeah so i think and then the lunch skipping so i have a double sort of daily fast right so i do the nightly fast but i also do at least a, a partial daily fast so um i think that the probably twice a year is, is good enough yeah you mentioned that that you have a study coming out soon. I mean, where is your focus clinically at the moment, and what are you looking to kind of explore in terms of your research? The moving it to standard of care is my ambition for anything mm. that is cardiometabolic, right? So, uh, diabetes, pre-diabetes, metabolic syndrome. I think we're getting very close to you know um, have the uh, conclusive studies. And this is not gonna be conclusive, but it's certainly these three or four that we're publishing now are gonna move in that direction where I think most people say, okay, I believe this. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we're gonna need, uh, in some cases, um, talking to the FDA, in some cases, maybe not, maybe have programs that are more lifestyle centered in support of the standard of care. But I think the FDA is now starting to understand, appreciate more that they have to allow so this lifestyle intervention to go after the diseases because uh, um, because of the obvious uh, very bad state we're in, you know, with almost twenty percent of the GDP uh, going to healthcare. So um, yeah, so uh, cardio metabolic, and then slowly moving. I mean, metabolic, and then slowly moving to cardiac, you know, so prevention and pot- potentially treatment, um, and then of course cancer. So so lots of trials going on for cancer. And uh, we're excited now. We we just went to the FDA, filed an IND, and now we got sort of the okay to proceed with the with the FDA process mm. for a food as a drug for hormone therapy. 
So in combination with a hormone therapy for women with breast cancer. So that's great because uh, uh, we thought maybe the FDA is going to be uh, opposed to this, but I think they were very, they seem to be very supportive. Mm. And, and, and that's uh, cool. so that, that's good news. And I think, you know, uh, the more the merrier, I encourage every, you know, university that wants to do studies, we'll, we'll help them, we'll, we'll give them the FMD and they can tell us the results, right? So, yeah. so the, I'm very uh, enthusiastic about Alzheimer because of course of the uh, brain rewiring that occurs during, I mean, now we have data from mice, but let's say that, that this is really changing the way the brain uh, functions for, for five days. And so, um, we, we like this idea that maybe that's what's needed for Alzheimer's. So many drugs have failed. And uh, so maybe a complete uh, reset of the brain uh, in mm -hmm. some ways that it may help, you know, it's kind of going to be a miracle, but certainly uh, if it helps people, I mean, people don't realize if we postpone aging by five years, we will cut Alzheimer's cases by, by half wow. or so, right? Yeah. So all we need... Yeah. To, to to get rid of almost half of, of Alzheimer's cases is to slow down the aging process five years. Mm -hmm. That's why I think that you know Del Bredesen and other now are talking about you know the ability to uh, detect 20, 30 years before. So now if you're 50 and you mm -hmm. you can tell that 80 um, you're gonna have Alzheimer, um, then that's a great time to switch to longevity diet plus FMD, and we're I mean, I'd be shocked if we don't give you the extra five years. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, now we have data, not just our own, looking at 15 to 20 years of, uh, of life expectancy. So, um, so yeah, so I think that's, uh, that's uh, some of the, the enthusiasm um, for, for what we do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think with the advent of, of scanning technology and the ability to early detect some of these things is going to be a huge thing as well because if you know early on this is where you're headed and you have these tools that you're developing at the consumer's disposal to deploy to prevent them from getting that i mean it's 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 massive yes and especially now because i think that a lot of physicians were trained in this world whether it was cardiovascular disease mm -hmm. or diabetes or alzheimer there's nothing you can do about it Mm -hmm. It's that's it. You're stuck with diabetes, which is shocking that anybody will say that. But that's what uh, that's been the story for a long, long time. Now I think everybody, including the physicians, are starting to say, "Well, maybe not. Right? Maybe mm -hmm. now we can do something about it." Uh, that's when then you want to know. Uh, you want to know <laughs> that uh, you're insulin resistant, or you want to know that um, your calcium score is very high and and you uh, are at risk of of uh, having a heart attack. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, because now you have interventions, especially nutritional, that can revolutionize or or certainly have a big, big uh, effect on the on the risk. And um, and so yeah, good to know. I mean, it's massively important. Heart disease being America's number one killer, the explosion of rates of type two diabetes, Alzheimer rates also escalating alarmingly. Like this is where our focus needs to be at dealing with these are the these are the three big conditions that are plaguing the most people. Yeah, and don't forget that diabetes almost doubles the chance of Alzheimer, right? Mm. So we already know that a big factor in Alzheimer um, is the you know the the metabolic uh, uh, dysfunction. Um, so. If it doubles that, now if you can intervene and now you have 70, 72% of people overweight or obese and you know, 10% of the population being diabetic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's just shocking. Shocking there is not a government-centered uh, big effort. And right. we, we're now presenting some of the calculations like how much you will save if you had the team that I'm talking yeah. about. You will spend every dollar you spend, you get 10 back or five mm -hmm. to 10 back. Um, and, um, it, but then you get it back just with the diabetes. That's an incredible thing, right? So if for every dollar you spend in this team of dietitian, molecular biologists, physician, psychologists, you get five back just for diabetes. Then the rest of it is bonus, the Alzheimer, the cardiovascular disease, the cancer, right? So it's just, uh, I don't have an explanation other than the unconspired conspiracy. There's yeah. just too many people that are making money uh, the way it is, and uh, nobody wants to change it. And so the media is confusing the hell out of everybody, and uh, and people 
They say, I don't know what to do every day. Low carb, high carb, high protein, mm -hmm. low protein. Now they're gonna listen to me and say, oh, low protein now, this is a new thing. Uh, so yeah, that, that's, um, that's you know, we, we're moving away from, from facts and moving into fashion. And, uh, and this is very convenient for people that are making lots of money the way mm -hmm. the system is, because then if it's confused, you don't change right, it, right? Right, Yeah, from the tobacco industry, confusion is our product. As long as consumers are confused, they'll continue to purchase our thing and remain in the dark. And this is much harder, right? Because now food, I just mentioned pasta, bread, you know? So if you eat the right amount, it's perfectly fine. And when you go to an excess, if you have, like in Italy, uh, everybody was blaming sugary drinks for the overweight. So the Italians are now at the same level of overweight as the Americans. And everybody was uh, uh, blaming junk food and the sugary drinks. Mm -hmm. When we looked at it, it turned out that it was uh, pasta, size. bread, the potatoes, the fruit juices. They had uh, one pound a day of this, right? But yet everybody was blaming something else, right? So, um, I think that um, it's much harder to fight because most of these things are perfectly fine for you uh, until you have one pound a day uh, or, or two pounds a day of it, right? So now it becomes a problem. So then the company that sells uh, uh, bread or, or, or pasta or, or potatoes say, you're crazy. There's nothing wrong with potatoes. I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, once you, you, you now have 10% extra every day, that's all you need, not even. Two yeah. percent, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two, so an extra 50 calories a day. And if you look at the last 40 years, that's all that has increased, calorie intake. It's not about protein. When we had the low fat uh, period, people gain weight. We had the low carb period, people gain weight. So, but we now have hundreds of calories more than 50 years ago that we take in per day. And that's what, uh, and that's what does the trick. And of course, the, the composition also matters, right? So if you have, you know, the, the, the red meat, et cetera, et cetera. Now we know that, um, as I just mentioned from this meta-analysis, uh, so it's not just about the calories, but certainly the calories are a good place to start. Mm -hmm. I do think the pasta in Italy is different though. When you eat it there, I don't feel, I feel fine after eating it there. Whereas when I eat it here, I feel lethargic and tired after eating it. I don't know if it, the flour is different or what's going on. Like, do you have a sense of that? Or is it just, I have a romantic... You know, I'm having yeah. a romantic experience being in Italy and No, I'm gonna it. make the Minister of Agriculture very happy by saying, buy Italian pasta, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's available in the United States. And uh, so we didn't set up to, to uh, advertise for anybody, but uh, maybe, right? It's yeah. possible that there are, you know, certainly different pastas and made different ways and with different gluten levels, mm -hmm. with different grains. And uh, I think the best one is probably the, the, the one that with the whole grains. Sure. Um, you know, the, the, the much lower gluten, that's what we used to use back in the days, you know, maybe, you know, 70 or 80 years ago. And uh, those are probably preferable, but, uh, you know, most of the pastas out there are high gluten and, they, um, and they're not uh, using these this, uh, old grains. Mm -hmm. Not anymore. Um, well, I think a good way to kind of end this is, is with a few thoughts for the person uh, who's new to all of this and is thinking, wow, this is some great information. I'm excited about this. I want to try an FMD. Um, I should get my blood work done, figure out where I'm at. Like what are, what are, what is like a good on-ramp for the uninitiated to begin to start thinking about food, diet, lifestyle, longevity? Probably get my book. Uh, mm -hmm. It's all, I don't make a penny out of it. It's all going to the- to so You the, give all the money to-, to Yeah, 100% yeah, of the, the, of the, of the funds research. go to, to charity or, or to the foundation. And, and I think the book is pretty um, extensively explaining um, mm -hmm. the, everything we talked about. Uh, I don't think I have anything that I would like to change other than maybe emphasize more the personalization, you know? I don't think I did a good enough job in the, the original book talking about you know, if you're gluten sensitive, if you're sensitive to tomatoes or you're sensitive to something, you probably, you know, need to avoid some of these things and, and find a, an alternate. Um, and next year I'm gonna come up with, the, I published it in Italy and now it's coming, the cancer um, book, you know, so all mm -hmm. the, we, uh, that we do be, uh, focus on cancer and how nutrition can make a big impact in uh, fasting and mimicking diets, but also nutrition make a bigger uh, impact on, uh, 
and cancer patients, uh, both prevention and treatment. So that's coming maybe about a year from now, yeah. Mm. Well, I think you're performing an unbelievable service at a great time of need in terms of health. So I applaud you, I'm at your service. I appreciate the work that you do. And I'm excited to see where this science takes us. I think it feels like we're on the precipice of some pretty amazing breakthroughs as the convergence of all these different research modalities and, and technologies become more robust and widely available. I think we're gonna see some really cool stuff happening. Yes, yes. And thank you for, for doing uh, an amazing job on your side. I think uh, uh, the information, uh, we could do all the work in the world and if it doesn't get out there explained correctly, uh, it's like, like Pierandello used to say, it's like it never existed. You know? Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. So pick up Walter's book, The Longevity Diet. Uh, and if they want to learn more about you, your website, walterlongo.com or where should uh, they go? The, uh, yeah, I think the foundation, Create Cures Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and again, there's a createcures.org. Uh, uh, there's a clinic uh, um, that you can uh, visit. Uh, um, and um, yeah, so createcures.org is probably the best uh, information. Facebook also, mm -hmm. uh, Professor Walter Longo, English uh, site. You know, we have lots of articles that we publish on, um, on everybody, not just what we do. Yeah. yeah, cool. And enjoy Italy. Well, thank you. Yeah, you go six months, six months. Six months in Italy now, a rough yeah. uh, six months of Italian summer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm jealous, my friend. Well, I appreciate talking to you always. You're always welcome here and uh, enjoy your summer and stay in touch. Thanks, Rich. Sure. Peace. Bye.